the last video, we ended by talking about how all the research methods uh, that we uh, highlighted could not determine cause and effect relationships. I then proposed the question about whether or not we even care about cause. Is cause even important? Well, we can stop and we can ask the question. For example, when you saw that uh, cheese sales correlated with people dying in their bed sheets, what was your first question? I would bet most of you wanted to know why. Or if I told you that ice cream sales led to shark attacks, you'd want to know why. If I told you that having uh, girls was more likely to create a divorce, you'd probably want to know why. In fact, I'd argue that cause is not only important, cause is the fundamental question we have. What we really want to know is we want to know why. That's the whole point. That's why you're taking this class, right? We want to know why. And cause is the answer to the why question. So not only is cause important, it's probably the single most important question. And yet none of the research techniques we've talked about can determine cause. So what are we going to do? Well, it turns out there is a way to determine a causal relationship. There is a way to determine cause and effect. We have a research method that does just this. It is the experiment. The experiment is able to determine cause because of its ability to control for what are called confounds. The reason why none of the other research techniques can help us determine cause is because too many things are changing. We don't know which of the things that changed caused the result. In the experiment, we control for everything except a single variable. And we allow that one variable to change, and if nothing else changes, we know that any differences we see is from the one variable we allow to change. The experiment controls confounding variables. For example, if we wanted to study stress scores and we brought in two groups of people, we had one of them sort of hang out in this room here and another group, we had them squeezed into this group over here and we changed one thing. We changed, uh, say, uh, the decibel uh, sound. So in this room over here, we had a loud white noise going through speakers and in here we didn't have any white noise. And then we tested to see how stressed out the participants were and found that sure enough, the people in the white noise room were more stressed out. Can we say that the white noise caused them to be stressed? Well, I bet you're just sitting here looking at these two pictures. You can already sit there and say to yourself, well, wait a minute, there's some big differences here. The furniture looks more comfortable. There's less people, right? They're not squeezed in. These people seem to be dressed for something more formal. The color of the walls is different. The environment is different in every possible way. So if these people report being more stressed out than these people, was it because of the sound? Was it because of the chairs? Was it because of the proximity of other people? Right? Notice we have too many confounding variables to determine cause. However, if I had two groups of people who were in absolutely identical situations, except that one was exposed to the white noise and one was not, then any differences in stress scores could be contributed as being caused by the noise. And that's the key to the experiment. Control the confounds and manipulate only a single variable at a time. The variable that we manipulate, the variable that we are allowing to change between our groups, that we are trying to determine what effect it has, what causes it can incur, is called the independent variable. It's what we manipulate. For example, if you're a coffee connoisseur, you might be looking at this going, oh God, decaf, evil decaf, right? Well, we can recognize that by that orange top. But the idea is pretty much these are identical, you know, Yes, I know the, the tops are different colored, but if we give people a glass of each of these, the taste isn't much different. However, the content of the caffeine can be very different. We are manipulating the amount of caffeine in the coffee. It is the independent variable. Then we observe a change in behavior. What kind of behavior might occur from somebody who gets caffeine versus one who doesn't? You know, maybe someone looks jittery or gets angry or agitated. Whatever it is that we are predicting becomes the dependent variable. What we measure, what we look at, the effect of the independent variable is the dependent variable. When I'm trying to differentiate between the independent and the dependent variable, I often think of this question here. What is the effect of blank on blank? You should be able to take any research project and break it down into what is the effect of what they're looking at on what they're observing. 
right? What are they manipulating? What are they measuring? What is the effect of caffeine on fidgeting? What is the effect of white noise on stress, right? Take any experiment, break it down into this sentence, then you know your independent and dependent variable. The independent variable is the first blank, the dependent variable is the second blank. So most experiments are set up with groups. We have one group that is the experimental group, and they're the ones that get the treatment. So the experimental group gets the treatment, and then they are compared to a control group that does not get the treatment. Now, how do we pick our groups? Right? How should we select our groups? Right? Do we just do them alphabetically? Do we just do them chronologically? Right? Well, if you wanted to do a study on how people think about or view um, romantic comedies, should you go to a lineup of people ready to go to the next Star Wars release? Uh, maybe not. If you were going to study shopping behavior, should you leap into a Black Friday sale? If you were interested in healthy eating, should you find people that are willing to eat this KFC monstrosity, which is a hot dog where the bun is fried chicken? Well, these people are perfectly fine. The issue is, is that they are not necessarily representative of the general population. They have unique characteristics that would affect their view. We would not want to put Star Wars fans in one experimental group and say fans of Bridget Jones' diary in the control group and compare them in their feelings about romantic comedies. Right? That would uh, not produce meaningful results because our groups were not selected through random assignment. We need to make sure that the determining factor for who winds up in each group, the experimental group or the control group, is random chance alone. So remember, random sampling is how we get a sample from our population. Random assignment is how we define which group they go into. Both of them center around random chance alone. But remember, though, I said, right, we had two groups. The experimental group gets the treatment. The control gets nothing. Wait a minute. You should already be saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, there's a problem with this. All right, what's the problem with this? Well, the problem is we've introduced a confounding variable, right? If the experimental group is getting a treatment and the control group is getting nothing, this is a confound. All right, should the control group really be getting nothing? It creates a different experimental environment and thus is a confound. And this is where the importance of the placebo effect comes in. If you believe it will affect your will, if you don't, it won't. The placebo effect is this idea that our expectations define our reality. This is, goes back to what we talked about in that very first intro module, right? What we expect determines our reality. Right? People have strong reactions to expectations. I've seen studies where people have a placebo alcoholic drink, where people think there's alcohol in it, even though there's no alcohol in it at all, and they get so drunk they're not safe to drive. Right? The expectation alone drives the behavior. If you think taking this pill will make you better, it probably will. If you think it won't, it probably won't. Right? Our expectation drives our reality. So the placebo is where we try to make it so that the control group has a similar experiment experience to the experimental group. For example, if the experimental group is taking a drug, then the control group should take a pill that looks just like the drug but doesn't contain any active ingredients. There's different ways of trying to construct a placebo. It's easier said than done in psychological research. Well, what about the researcher? Can the researcher know who gets the placebo? Who's in the control? Who's in the experimental group? Well, in fact, we know that researchers can actually alter or change an experiment if they know who is who. And this creates what we consider sort of the double blind experimental standard in any field where both the subject and the researcher don't know whether or not they're receiving the placebo or the actual treatment. This is a lot easier to do in some situations than others. Like for example, therapy. Can, it becomes very difficult for a therapist to not know whether or not they're giving real therapy or placebo therapy. What the heck is even a placebo to therapy? Right, these are difficult questions that psychology constantly has to wrestle with but truly the gold standard of the experiment that really allows us to determine the cause and effect relationship is the double blind study where both the researcher and the subject are blind. They don't know who gets the placebo and who is in the experimental group.